Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast which we disassemble a film from the Marvel Cinematic Universe into one-minute segments, and then examine it in obsessive and occasionally hilarious detail. I'm Kyle Olson from the Swashbuckling Ladies Debate Society podcast. Hey, and I'm Rob Cabosco and Kyle. Yes, sir. I could have done so many things on the opening of this minute. I mean, I was ready to do Tour of the 19th Century, mm. 1802, English chemist Humphrey Davy develops the first incandescent light. Well, Going sure. Like, I mean, that's just obvious. I know. 1878, Edison, who does not invent the light bulb. He no. He just makes it commercial. You know, and we could have gone all the way to 1894, where the Parisian magazine Le Petit Journal talks about the world's first motoring competition. And then a year later, the first American road race happens in Chicago for Thanksgiving Day. Could have talked about starting lights. Why are the starting lights arranged in five red lights? And why are they different and vertical as a Christmas tree for drag races? I could have done all that. Instead, you want to talk about Driven, directed by Ron Howard. No, I'm not going to do any of that. You know what I'm going to do? All right. I tried to Here's what what I'm going to do. That's right. Say hello to the bad guy, Razor <laughs> Ramon, WWE former <laughs> intercontinental champion. Bad times Please. don't last, but bad guys do. What's the thing that makes Razor Ramon important? His toothpick. Mm, oh, the toothpick. <laughs> so the toothpick. Of course. It's not. And here's the deal about toothpicks. Not just the oldest instruments for dental cleaning. They're older than humans themselves. Skulls of Neanderthals, as well as Homo sapiens, show clear signs of teeth picked with a tool. What a perfect intro. <laughs> it doesn't get much more segue than that here at minute 31 of Iron Man 2, directed by John Favreau from the far off year of 2010. Uh, but to uh, to discover the, the depths of motor racing, which we will be doing for the next five minutes, we brought on our resident gearhead. Mr. Pete Wright. <laughs> God bless Iron Man. God bless America. <laughs> I love your Iron Man podcast. Tell me more about those toothpicks. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we're gonna, we're this minute we're gonna we're gonna get so deep into the weeds. Yeah. The toothpicks are barely the beginning. Yeah. Let's let's do it. I I love that you uh, call me a gearhead. Like I barely know how to put the key in my Saturn. This is delightful. What uh-huh. I do have though coming up this week, I'm excited about is a couple of character uh, reveals that I'm pretty excited about joining you for. So. Mm, okay, all right. So let's let's pick up where we left off, uh, which is in the kind of interview going on between Christine and Justin Hammer. Um, we, then when we left them, uh, things were not going well because uh, Tony Stark had stolen the spotlight, even though he's not even in the room. Uh, and so Justin is now frantically trying to get attention back on him. Uh, so he's uh, asking <laughs> what, what always goes well in any interview. Can you read me back what you wrote? Uh, <laughs> Has anybody said yet on this show Justin gets hammered? Because that's the no. that's the line I was hoping to walk in with. No, Justin gets hammered, <laughs> and there it is. There yeah. we go. <laughs> Christine, like basically, you know, she's a good reporter because she sees, hey, there's a much bigger story because no one's gonna be talking about Justin Hammer after today. That's right. <laughs> so she's like, I, I got a, I got a thing. I really, I need to. Can I just? Uh, and he tries to stop her by saying, I've got some caviar coming, which is such like the nouveau riche, like this is what rich people do kind of thing that I love about Justin Hammer. <laughs> He's fantastic. I, I think they're at, I think they're at his table, right? That's his yes. table because That's his there's table. the whole tone power move where he sits down right. at Justin's table and then gets up that we just missed. Yeah. And I think that has set up Justin, which is just like it is right in Sam Rockwell's wheelhouse to be yeah. completely out awkwarded. Like he's <laughs> he's just amazing here at when she finally gets up and leaves and he's alone at his corner table watching his nemesis in getting uh, suited up. And there's Fantastic. that great little piece of editing where he like turns and looks at the camera and it looks like Tony is looking back yeah. and pointing at him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they just cut to that reaction shot of Sam Rockwell going, huh? Like, <laughs> oh, knowing, no, Kyle, though, knowing that you're an antagonist uh, mm-hmm. in, in this discussion yes. for this movie, um, is that is that too too clever uh, for its own good? Those kind of
You know, like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, like, I thought it was like a, a clever way to do that because is he really looking out through the screen? No, but right. just you, you're getting a little insight into Justin's mind at that point that like, even though Tony's not here, he's still the most important person in the room. But you know, what's so great is both of these guys are such extraordinary, like cosmic narcissists yes. in this, at this point yes. that most of me is thinking, I'll bet Tony's in that car pointing and he's saying, <laughs> I hope you're watching Justin because this is for you. <laughs> That's like, exactly this, what he's doing. Right. You know, like these guys for are, for anybody are who's here. Right, yeah. they're they're already. Well, I don't know that. I don't know that Tony really thinks of Justin as any type of rival. I think. Right. Uh, I right. think it's so I think it's right? if, if I thought of you, uh, it, you know, you despise me, don't you? Right. If yeah. I thought of you, I probably would. Right. <laughs> but don't you love? I love how with Justin Hammer and okay, and Sam Rockwell nails this when he turns around. He's looking at the screen, and the screen here's Tony. Right. Yes, of mm-hmm. course, to the camera. His eyes get wide, like what? And then they get really narrow because <laughs> Justin's going. How does he do that? <laughs> how does he, Which is his constant state, right? Yeah. It's his constant state in this movie is how how am I even how do I put pants on in the morning? Well, and it's insecurity. It's it's all yeah. I mean that right yeah. there is a moment of tremendous insecurity being revealed in the character, which you've had right. it. That's a clear shot of it. I love it. It's yeah. Fantastic. So uh Tony's going out for a drive, uh, and he is driving uh, as as Pete would know the 1978 Wolf WR Ford replica. Uh, the Wolf WR is a Formula One car built for the 1977 season by the Walter Wolf Racing Team. Because when you need a car, you call the Wolf. <laughs> See so, what you did there? That was uh, fantastic. Can I just ask you? Do you please. know? Is this a thing? Like when you in in the Grand Prix? Is this a thing in Formula One where you're just driving replicas of old cars? Don't they make anything new anymore? It is. This is this is called the uh, Grand Prix Historique. So they do this as a prelude to the actual Grand Prix. Oh. Uh, and so they are allowed. And so there are categories and you are allowed to race against vintage cars from the same era. So that's why all the cars sort of look the same. These are all 1970s Formula One cars. Uh, okay, replicate. that's Obviously, very cool. They're actually there's only you know a, a handful, of them they actually build the rest are all CG. But we'll get into that. Um, but this actual this car, uh, let's see. I, I say for the for the gearheads, they're like, tell me about the motor. So I will. Uh, it's using a Ford Cosworth DFV, two thousand nine hundred ninety three cc's. That's one hundred eighty two point six cubic inches. Ah, ah, <laughs> it's just spoken like a man who lives and breathes it, right? It's naturally aspirated and mid-mounted. And the transmission, of course, is the Hewland FGA 400 six-speed manual gearbox. I know you guys are in awe. You're like, yeah, just, that he's, was using, he's using, using a Hewland there? in there? And you're like, yes, yes, he is using a Hewland. <laughs> Uh, so uh, let's 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 dig more into some obscure stuff because on the straps of Tony's uh, you know, restraint is Sparco. So Sparco SPA is an Italian auto part and accessory company headquartered in the beautiful city of Volpanio, Turin, Italia. Uh, it was founded in the far off year of 1977. Uh, on the side of Tony's helmet, as he turns to look at back at his crew chief, uh, he has a small sticker for Arai. Arai is the Arai Helmet Limited, a Japanese company that designs and manufactures motorcycle helmets. The business has roots from the turn of the century involving cap production, followed by military headgear from 1930s onwards, industrial helmets after World War II, and finally, motorcycle helmets from the early 1950s. Thank you, Wikipedia. You did all nice. the hard work. Of course. Well Feedback. I'm not going to try and and and, and uh, pronounce the actual Japanese name of it because I'm afraid I would offend anyone from Japan. Okay, that's probably smart. I here's a here's another character thing that I really love about this that when we see him speaking of the suit, right? Mm-hmm. This yeah. is Tony is this this sets up this next like five minutes sets up uh so much more about who tony is as a character like we know him as the iron man guy Mm -hmm. and he's a guy and he has a suit and when they're together it's iron man and we have these two halves of the same thing but look at this what this represents right here is a guy who cannot stay out of a suit like these suits (laughs) these driving suits are are bespoke suits right i mean they are made for the drivers they are measured perfect that means means tony knows at any moment he's going to be getting in a formula one race That's car right that, we, yeah, we talked about ready. that previously about like who knew and stuff too and it's right. like this wasn't a spontaneous decision like no. tony planned this because he brought his 
tailored <laughs> yeah. race car suit with him. I so. like to imagine it in the briefcase somehow. <laughs> like it's all all in one suit carriage. Uh, so I, I think that's really fascinating. Like Tony can't go for you know uh, uh, days, hours between having to pose in something else, right? Something else right. to protect who he is, right? To protect his his identity, some portion of his identity. Yeah. I think that's really great here. Yeah, crossing something else off his bucket yeah. list. Right. Like, I want to drive a car in the Grand Prix before I yeah. die. And so. I'm going to do How does he know how to do that? That's right? the other thing, too, is I guess we're meant to think that Tony's just good at everything. But yeah. uh, one of the things that Favreau talked about in the... I should say, actually, Mr. Favreau or John Favreau, yeah. not Favreau like I know him. Uh, you know, John. J.F. John, yeah. Yeah. J. Uh, yeah. Wait, can, you, uh, right. can you text him and ask if it's okay if I call him John? Hey, no, just hang um, on. Let me say, yeah. hey, John. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, that was I a little sad back. Call back. Yeah, that yeah. was a little nice. Yeah, that was, that's um, on you. So, uh, so. Uh, he talked about how this movie in particular is very influenced by the the eighties James Bond movies, and so mm-hmm. that's the same. I think James Bond is just good at everything, and so that's he is. the thing is, well, how does Tony know how to drive uh, a sports car? Or, I mean, how, a Formula One car? Because he's Tony Stark. That's why. Right. Right. Well, you know, and and this is a, a call forward and a call back at the same time. Like I was thinking about as watching the whole movie yesterday, uh, and that you know it it took him a while to learn to fly. Right. We have a little mm-hmm. bit of a sequence as we're building the suits and practicing and learning to fly, learning to fly. Um, and so once he masters the suit, he's mastered the suit. We never again see him have to learn how to do anything, right? True. He's, he right. never has to learn to do it. And in fact, that pays off in other characters, right? Once he learns to fly the suit, now uh, Rhodey can fly the suit. Right? And we hmm. see that in this movie. Like, there's no learning curve. He just gets in and does it and, and holds his own. So uh, you, you'll yeah, talk about true. that. Yeah, that's true. Even, in, even in the, right. even in the, the future sequel, we'll see yeah. other people just step into the suit and then can do it. Yeah, it just I think works. That's, I think the, the hint there is, is that we talked about this in a previous minute. There's a deleted scene where you see the course for this race. Mm-hmm. So he's been doing a prep. I would assume he's yeah. been yeah. doing that he's been practicing. simulations. He's been, yeah. sim- he's been do- doing simulations in the workshop. And I think he's been making, he's been developing the technology to where not only the suits get better technologically, it's like a drone. You know, it's the difference between a radio controlled airplane and a drone. It actually gets easier for the user to do it. Or like, remember the first car you got with anti-lock brakes, right? And it starts like you suddenly don't have to think about something that you used to have to think about, right? right? Skid control, that kind of stuff. Or manual to automatic, I mean. Yeah, right? Yeah, Yeah. right. So we, uh, as as he's revving the engine, then we see the camera pans around the back and goes over all two thousand six hundred sixteen millimeters of the wheelbase. <laughs> Weird flex, but okay. Uh, and then, uh, and then on a red light, they go off. Well, of course, that's that's a Grand Prix thing. They have to wait for all the lights to be illuminated, as opposed to waiting right. for the green. Uh, so uh, as as he as he pulls away, then uh, we see a bunch of some more logos. We see STP. So. STP is an American brand and trade name for automotive aftermarket products, especially lubricants such as motor oil and motor additives. The name began as an abbreviation of scientifically treated petroleum. And you think that would be enough, but you're wrong because I dug further into it and found out the invention of STP was actually from German scientists during World War II because Germany needed lubrication. <laughs> the, the war machine must be lubricated. Uh, so then it's interesting because they, they talk a lot about uh, about how they used it uh, during World War II, of course, on the other side of the world that our, our people were on. Uh, but... Then there's a little uh, gray area, and then suddenly it's a part of an American company. Right. So I think a little <laughs> Project Paperclip might have been involved there. Like uh, <laughs> some guys carried the, the secret of STP over. Maybe perhaps there's an STP espionage movie out there. Oh, that movie made. needs to be made. Yeah. 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 If, if, as soon as we get tired of like current movies. Right. Right, they, as soon as we're tired of Edison on film. <laughs> it's the same guys that came over with all their rocketry knowledge. Right. Werner yeah. von Braun and yeah. everybody yeah. just said, yeah. They had to I send the, the rockets up. Said, I don't know. I don't care where they come down. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, and then you, you, did, you, did you catch Pirelli? There's a Pirelli on the tail. 
Do you have a bunch of news uh, about Pirelli? Let's see, Pirelli. I do have Pirelli. I was, I was, I was saving it for later. But yes, we can have oh. Pirelli. Well, it's just it's right there on the little fin. Scrolling. Is that what they call it? Is it a fin? I'm, I'm, it's pacing. Style. Style. You you see, we do a, we do a podcast. Style. We do a podcast here, and we need to pace things out. <laughs> so Pirelli actually later on in in the next minute actually gets a full on screen shot. So I was uh, saving okay. Pirelli for that. But you know you what? Know, I can hold on. Far be it for me to like you know. Do my job, but fine. If you want to talk about Pirelli, a, we can talk about Pirelli. Do we have a guest scheduled for the next minute? <laughs> no, no, it was just that Pete's just here for this one minute. <laughs> no, did. Do you want me to actually talk about Pirelli or do you want me to move on to the, and talk about it later? No, I just get excited about logos now. Okay. That's all. Well, I, believe me, I got plenty of logos. I'm, right. just, I'm just pacing them out because it gets a little thin from here on out. Uh, so as they're, as they're driving along, we see another racing company apparently called Maximilian Favreau. Oh. Well, that's Max Favreau. That's John Favreau. Rose son. He put that in as a little homage. That's nice. cute. So uh, all that. these as they're as they're racing along, all these cars are fake. Every single one of the ones you see are actually CG. They went down to Monaco and actually shot plates of uh, the empty track before the the couple days before the race. And so all these cars, none of them are actually there. So these are all fake. Uh, interestingly, uh, because we talked in a previous minute about how Robert Downey Jr. wanted the car to be blue. And so then John Favreau basically said, okay, sure. And now goes, yeah, that was a brilliant move. Because <laughs> they were, I really like it blue now. But you can yeah. see, if you pause, right, as they come around the first turn, the actual original design of the car, because special effects happened before the, the shooting starts, is actually right behind Stark's car, so you can actually see the original red, you know, red accented design uh, of, that they were going to use in the car immediately behind him. Oh, and that's, that's, that's them, the Goodyear, the one with the Goodyear yeah, tail, yeah. right? Yeah, As exactly. he zoomed in behind the hammer car. Right. Yeah. So the hammer yeah. cars in front, in the in the maroon, and then yeah. the, behind him was the original design that they had come up with for Stark because you know Iron Man, it's red, so of course you do it red. I just I I think you guys are astute watchers of movies. I think you you said all that a little bit too quickly for me. I need to take a breath on that. <laughs> like, well, the nice every thing about podcasts is you can here, pause them. Every car in here is CG. Every car. Yes. And every car. In here. I look at that and think that is extraordinary that yeah. is extraordinary that this is one of those things this race did not exist yeah and this was 10 years ago yeah it, it is mean, like it's incredibly astounding. compelling uh work just artistry to yeah. to give you the feels the way they do on the shot that i will tell you that when the race first starts and they get that first shot where all the cars are coming towards the screen um the camera it's unbelievable it does there are CGI problems later in the race because yes. there's lighting issues on the cars. Yeah. We've but got some compositing with people and, and issues that I have to No, no, of yeah, course. Talk about. But yeah. and that's the only thing I would say about this. No, yeah. this shot, that is absolutely unbelievable. Those cars are not there. It's yeah. extraordinary. Yes. It really and, like, is. and none of them even existed. So it's not even yeah. like they took a car and scanned it and then, you know, no, made a digital right. copy and put it in there. Uh, no, so, same thing. Uh, same with the audience. Like when they're going by, like those are all fake people. When they when they cut to later on, and we like, we see people's reactions, those are real people. But like as yeah. they're as the cars oh, are racing by, there's no there were those were empty stands where they recorded yeah. it. And, and way, you know the still stuff, the motion stuff where he's in the cockpit looks it looks just great. Like all of that composing that next shot where we're we're behind the steering wheel and he's just jerking around as the as the world goes by is it's fantastic. It looks so good. Yeah, so Something shout out to Double Negative because Double oh, Negative yeah. did this whole sequence. Yeah, we're not going to make a mistake like we did on the Hulk, and we're going to credit properly this time. Yes, we are. <laughs> 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 well, the I, but in my, in my defense, ILM is involved in this. But it, it happened that during the sequence, during the the commentary, yeah. John Favreau specifically singled out Double Negative as doing yes. the majority of the effects uh, in this in this race. So let's see. All right. So as as we're going by, we have uh, we have some more logos. We have uh, Martini. Uh, you see across the top there. Uh, Martini is the racing name for Martini and Rossi. Uh, for those of our generation, we know Martini and Rossi, Asti Spamanti. Asti Spamanti. That's right. They're yeah. from. They're from. Uh, again, they're from. They make Martini Vermouth in Turin. In Italy as well, uh, they began they began doing sponsoring cars in 1958 as the Martini International Club. Founded wow. by Count Metallio Rossi di Montelia of Martini and Rossi. Uh, they, wow. they, their car designs are always dark blue, light blue, and red stripes on white, red, or silver background. 
the car the car model which one of the most titles for them is the lancia delta hf integrale and that's as close as i get to it <laughs> that was good that was good uh, on the side you'll see chapard chapard is le petit fils de le chapard and c sa which is a swiss manufacturer of luxury watches jewelry, and accessories it founded in 1860 by louis ulis chapard in saint switzerland Shout out to the Swiss. Uh, yeah, it's right, right around the corner of my house. I know. Yeah. Chopard has been, uh, had been, has been owned by the Schaffrela family of Germany. Because, you know, switching languages right in the middle there. Chopard is best known for making high-quality Swiss watches. His clients have included Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. Oh, and they're headquartered no. in Geneva. He is a real watch hound. <laughs> if anything, if anything, we know knows that <laughs> about Sar Nicholas. The one thing that comes up all the time, yeah. man, oh. that guy loved his watches. <laughs> Um, we also see a logo for Bridgestone. Bridgestone is a Japanese multinational auto and truck parts manufacturer founded in 1931 by Shojiro Ishibashi in the city of Kurumi, Fukuya, Japan. And I know I got at least two of those words wrong. <laughs> Uh, the name Bridgestone comes from a calc translation and transposition of Ishibashi, meaning stone bridge in Japanese. I those, never knew that. Those of us who are in Arizona are familiar with their work. They were the original fabricators of the inflatable dam in Tempe Town Lake, which is uh, right by the campus of Arizona State University. So they made these bladders that were in the desert. And we created a lake, because that's what we do, and uh, the original dam system, which was this inflatable dam, if you can imagine that, was made by Bridgestone. Had a couple problems. There was a bit of a quarrel between the city and Bridgestone, but anyway. <laughs> it burst. It, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean As to balloons do. Really? Bridgestone, but it's the desert. Did I mention we're in the desert? Uh, problems. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> so um, there, there was a, a real car that they built, but uh, Robbie John Jr. did not do most of his driving. Actually, the driving was done by Tanner Faust. And for those of you who know Tanner Faust, he was a stunt driver, but he's done Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift, Ford versus Ferrari, Need for Speed, and the Dukes of Hazard. But I know him because he was one of the hosts of the American version of Top Gear, which ran from 2010 sure. to 2016. Uh, the he was there with two other guys. Uh, Adam Ferreira, and Rutledge Wood. And most of you might probably know Rutledge Wood because he's the current host of The, the Floor, Floor is Lava, Lava on Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, we, we were big fans of the original Top Gear, uh, and then we watched uh, all these American ones too, so we became a big fan of Tanner. Tanner is highly competitive, which was really funny to watch in that Rutledge doesn't care at all, which just drove him crazy. Um, <laughs> but there was even a... One of the, I remember one of his best things was he got a... A Raptor, a Ford Raptor, which they modified to become a Ford Velociraptor, <laughs> and they had a guy jump out of a plane, and at equal distance, he had the Velociraptor, and they were trying to reach and see who could go faster from an equal distance, like one above and then one yeah. far out to reach there. It was a really good stunt. So oh, what you're telling me with, with uh, Tanner in here, so they... He's doing the driving. At what point do they... Did they ever actually put him on this track? No. This that was all that was all shot was all in after California in California. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So right. like, yeah, I, I found out. So that that shot that I just talked about the the Robert Downey Jr. shot that we've yeah. got when he's in the cockpit. Do you think that was like that was that was like face replacement? They put his face in the mask, or what do you think? I'm they not were sure. Doing I that? think that might have been that might have been poor man's process. That might have yeah. been just they mount a camera in there and then have a bunch of teamsters shaking Shake the car. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then yeah. you know add in the sound of. Yeah. And, and the, the world going totally by, convinced. Monica right. going by. I'm convinced. <laughs> well, there you go. That's yeah. all we needed. Yeah. yeah. But the, I, I was curious to see like how much actual driving was really done, and it's very, yeah. very difficult to tell because they they did build a section of track, which we're we're going to see here shortly. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't not it was not in Monaco because that's the place where we see our old pal Ivan. Uh, as you can see, his name tag reads Boris Tur B Turgenov B for Boris. Wait, that's uh, not Bob. No, it's not Bob. Bob no, because there had there's there's a major Russian contingent. There had to be a Boris in here. It's yeah. just required. Uh, so he's just cruising around trackside, looking bulky. But, he's you looking. Know, he's swole. Is what yeah, is he's the word? A little I swole. Yeah. He's swole. 
He was uh, a wrestler. Come on. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> he was the wrestler. I don't know yeah, if you've heard. Yeah, but yeah. The wrestler. That's right. He gets he's got the toothpick. Yeah, I mean, like, he's, he's got the toothpick. Got the that's toothpick. what I said. And we're back. Welcome to the callback. Hey, yo. <laughs> So uh, and then uh, on a on a room room uh, we end the minute. That's where our minute comes to an end. So interesting on the on the shot here uh, on the final shot of this minute. They're coming around. There's a building in the uh, background that's kind of got like a uh, copper with a patina uh, roof. That's the opera house. I'm oh. a little bit unclear, and we're going to talk about this over the next couple of minutes about the geography of this because that is the building that is across the street from the Hotel de Paris. So. Are they driving around? It's I'm I'm unclear a little bit of the geography, but looking at the maps and stuff, that is what that is. So apparently, the the it, people know this course so well that every turn is famous, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm sure this has a specific uh, that course. The one that we're that they're going to where where most of the action place is, is actually called Tobacco Corner. This is not going to be helpful at all. But you know, <laughs> I've I, I've been to Monaco. Which oh, is, okay. Which is a Ooh, clank. I, yeah, I. <laughs> you just dropped uh, yeah. something there. Did you want to pick that up? I I did, and I I can tell you absolutely that I don't remember anything about the geography of the race course because it was not race season. There were just cars <laughs> right. on the road, um, just but millionaires I, driving around. I mean, and that's that is go, right? that is the that is the one thing you take away from from the place, and it's not it's not like. Um, you know, you go to Las Vegas or Atlantic City or someplace like that, and you have the giant buildings and they're beautiful and all that is just wonderful. And then there are also people who, you know, drive down from Portland to see if they can make a few hundred bucks on a slot machine and have a good weekend and a show. Yeah, like right. there's just a there's a there's a, a place where these cultures kind of collide. That does not exist in Monaco. It is, it was so, I mean, from Every street corner pavement, like uh, topper, to the hi- top of the very highest, highest, you know, uh, spire. It is just extraordinary wealth, and um, and so like to watch like the size of the smallest boats in the in the um, you know main port right in front of. Every, I mean, it's just, they're just so massive. Like it's something I've never seen before or since this is this is where the money goes right <laughs> right here uh so um it's how, it was, how poor did you feel so poor so <laughs> poor because yeah i felt like i was on a leash like going in there like you just you cross the border and you're like leashed up and it's just like no you can't you can't afford to walk there right like you just you just you immediately you you stand up straighter and you kind of wander around the streets to be like pretending preening a little bit because you don't fit in you just don't fit in so uh but it's it's extraordinary and what i, I mean you know all that is worth nothing uh because a lot of people have probably been through monaco but i can tell you that this uh it, it it looks familiar to that sense memory that I had when I was, when I was there, I'd been living in France for a long time. And I mean, it was, it was, it just like, this is this, this felt like, like that place. I think they did a terrific job. Well, considering, no, I mean, I'll tell you this. I think it's just amazing to me that all this, almost all this is not real. Like yeah. in terms of, in terms of the race, I just, yeah. all of this is mind blowing. And considering this is 10 years old, I'm, I'm shocked at the quality of the, of the graphics here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as we've talked a lot about logos, if you're a fan of logos, we've got some of our own. You can go to our merch store and get our logos plastered on pretty much whatever you want. T-shirts, pillows, mugs, even masks. You can put our faces on your face. And when you do, we'll even donate a mask to a frontline worker because that's the kind of people we are. So nextreel.com slash merch. Buy stuff with names on it because that's the American way. <laughs> so thank you, Pete, for joining us. Are you going to hang around as we continue our, our room room trip through Monaco? I, I was informed that I'm not allowed to be on because I've insulted <laughs> the host. If we can have my people like negotiate maybe with your people. Oh, oh no, if no, we no. kicked off everyone who insulted us, we never have guests. <laughs> uh, and that would begin with me. I wouldn't be on the show. <laughs> Well, then I'll see you for minute 32. All right. So the race continues in minute 32, so do not miss it. Enough said. Bye. Bye.